Good afternoon. My name is Camille Perstedt. I'm presenting to you today from the Laboratory of Environmental Biotechnology in Narbonne in France. I'm going to be talking today about the ecological engineering of methanotropic photogranules. My talk is split into four major parts. I'm going to be introducing briefly the problem of methane outgassing, notably from anaerobic digesters. Then I'm going to be introducing our approach to engineering a microbial community to catalyze the desired ecosystem function, notably methanotropic photogranules in which methane is converted. Afterwards, we will be following in the, the assembled communities in a bioreactor at a lab scale, the, the community dynamics. And I'll be discussing unintended intended and more complex trophic interactions in our community. An anaerobic digester normally has a headspace uh, where methane concentrations are about 60%, so that uh, because of the gas uh, liquid equilibrium, there is quite a high concentration of methane in the liquid phase. When this water is leaving, the headspace concentration is much lower, approaching zero, and methane, finding its new equilibrium, is outgassing into the atmosphere. This is bad because methane is a very potent greenhouse gas, and the outgassing reduces or even eliminates the environmental benefit that we could possibly get from generating methane as an energy resource. Outgassing is an even bigger problem in colder climates because cold water dissolves more methane so that more methane can, can leave the, the water phase through outgassing. Our idea to community design was rather simple. Let's just build a methanotrophic community, put it in a continuously stirred tank reactor to convert the methane and then get the, the environmental benefit from that. However, there are two important things to consider. One is how, how would you retain the methanotropes in the system? And secondly, how would you want to avoid blowing oxygen into the system, possibly creating uh, an explosive gas mixture of oxygen and methane? Our approach here was to graft methanotropes essentially onto a, an existing photogranular chassis. And by doing that, phototrophs can produce oxygen that is degraded uh, by methane conversion. What do photogranules look like? I've presented you here three different images. One is from a sequencing batch reactor on the left, where you see just a, an, a general overview of different uh, shapes and forms of photogranules. They can reach up to sizes of three, four millimeters. On the right-hand side, you see on the top an, a bird's eye view on a photogranule, essentially, seeing a little, uh, you'll be seeing a little filament sticking out of the photogranules. Those are cyanobacteria, the, the essential phototrophic part of this granule. And when you cut the granule at the lower part here, you will see that the cyanobacteria form one or two bands on the outside that it has a thickness of a couple of hundreds mic of micrometers, essentially indicating the, the penetration depth of light. Now, we use non-methanotrophic photogranules as a chassis, and in there you find syntrophic interactions between heterotrophic bacteria and the cyanobacteria, essentially around CO2 and oxygen. Heterotrophs produce the CO2 that cyanobacteria take up. Cyanobacteria produce the oxygen that is taken up by heterotrophs, and all of this is fueled by carbon entering the system. Now what we're going to be doing is, or what we did is, we added an enrichment of methanotropes that convert methane by oxidizing it using oxygen to CO2, leading, in theory, to a new type of photogranule where cyanobacteria now fuel general heterotrophic bacteria and methanotropes. And when you feed the system only with methane, you should be able to get methanotropic uh, photogranules. We produced an inoculum of about 60 of these tiny little photogranules, and these we used in a CSDR reactor to launch a new operation. And what I present you here are methane removal uh, efficiencies over time, 100 days about, between the start of the reactor and the end of the reactor. And what you can see is that uh, methane was, uh, after a startup phase of a couple of weeks, or less stable at around 80% of removal. We don't add to this reactor oxygen at all. So every methane molecule that is oxidized is oxidized because of uh, oxygen generated by uh, uh, cyanobacteria. 
In the reactor, we had a comparably high yield of biomass of about 0.7 grams TSS per gram CUD, and this is caused by incorporation of CO2 into the growing phototrophic biomass. We're now going to be looking at the fate of methanotrophs and photogranules, and with a slight emphasis on uh, potential preferential associations between methanotrophs and cyanobacteria. Please note that in the following, on the following slides, each bar in the bar plots presents one photogranule in the community and one photogranule. And the size of photogranules over the experiment was more or less the, the same, so that we're actually, uh, we're actually able to compare community sizes, which makes it possible to interpret uh, relative abundances as actual changes in, uh, in community sizes. Let's have a look first at cyanobacteria. There are also some microalgae to be found in photogranules, but those are typically fewer, much fewer than the others. So the filamentous cyanobacteria that we're going to be looking at are left to limbia and uh, formidium strains, identified by 23S RNA uh, sequencing. In the activated sludge, you find actually uh, a majority of microalgae. However, don't get this wrong. There are very few phototropic sequences in activated sludge. So actually, uh, this is not extremely meaningful. And photogranules, the, the ones that we used uh, to graft methanotropes on, we find essentially uh, leptolingia in there. Now, when we prepared the, the inoculum after the, the merging of methanotropes with the photogranules, leptolingia was stable at uh, more than 80, 90% about in the inoculum photogranules. Please note, as I said before, these are four different photogranules where I show you the community for. Now, when we put these photogranules in a reactor, we noticed an interesting thing. There seems to be some competitive exclusion of cyanobacteria at most dates. So it's either formidium with a little bit of leptolingia or a lot of leptolingia with very little uh, formidium present. And you see that on three different sampling dates. And even at one sampling dates, you can find the two uh, types of uh, dominance in cyanobacteria during continuous operation. Now let's have a quick look at the methanotrophs. We need to differentiate here methanotrophs that actually convert methane and non-methanotropic methylotrophs. Methanotrophs are also methano uh, methylotrophs, but uh, well, they convert methane. And non-methanotropic methylotrophs do not convert methane, but use other C1 compounds. And uh, notably, methanol. Uh, that is oxidized into CO2. This is going to be become, uh, becoming interesting and important later on in my talk. When you look at the background biomass from activated sludge or classic OPGs, you find hardly any methanotrophs or in general methylotrophs in there. The relative abundance was very, very, very low. However, once we started feeding um, the photogranules that we used with uh, together with the methanotrophs, the relative abundances of the methanotrophs can increase of the overall bacteria actually to more than 20%. And on average, there are about 5% of non methanotrophic methylotrophs in there. However, this is quite variable per photogranule, even though all these photogranules shared the same space in one uh, bottle. When we now look, as, as we did before, on the continuous operation of the reactor, we can see that there are, in general, much fewer methylotropes in general and uh, methanotropes uh, as well. And this is probably due to the much, much lower load of methane during continuous operation than during batch feeding and enrichment. Again, we see that the abundance patterns are highly variable between different granules. And to our surprise, we found a couple of granules where the majority of methylotrophs were actually non-methanotrophic. That means to us that actually the part that we expect to do the, the ecosystem service the, that we intended is not present or barely present in these photogranules. This came as a big surprise to us because as you saw before, the, the reactor was overall fairly well uh, doing its job. 
Now, when we combine the, the data that I presented you before of the cyanobacteria with the methylo methylotropes, you can see here that the non-methanotropic methylotropes dominating the photogranules coincide with an abundance of leptolingbia. So it looks that there is a preferential pairing of leptolingbia with the non-methanotropic methylotropes in these granules. So to sum up things a little here and discuss a little further, uh, I need to state that all photogranules in our reactor are not created equal. So that means we can, by sampling different uh, uh, photogranules from one reactor, we don't necessarily have repetitive uh, or replicate samples. There is some issue there between non-methanotropic and uh, non-methanotropic methylotropes versus methanotropes and leptolingia versus comedium. So what I drew here is essentially uh, um, a rendition of the two different types of uh, photogranules. On the left, you see the one that has a majority of methanotropes, probably producing methanol as intermediate. And on the right, you see the photogranule that contains much more of the non-methanotropic methylotropes, possibly using methanol as a metabolite to start their metabolism. And this methanol may come from trophic interaction between photogranules with methanol as an intermediate that leaks out of uh, the, the methanotropic photogranules. This is definitely a possibility that we need to investigate a, a little further. The question that we ask ourselves now is, is that an involuntary division of labor in methane oxidation? Because for the methanotrope, it's definitely thermodynamically a loss to, uh, to not use methanol for further oxidation. However, in nature, this kind of division of labor is uh, quite frequently observed in these systems. And could there possibly an ecological benefit for the methanotropes of this, or is this really just a loss because of mass, uh, a disadvantage because of the uh, loss and, uh, of methanol? Well, our idea was rather simple, as, a, as I said, to put the, our little bricks together, phototrophs, methanotrophs, and we get nice little phototrophic, uh, methanotrophic granules. However, the outcome was a little unexpected. First of all, we have a highly uh, diverse system, uh, diverse in the sense that we don't replicate our granules in every individual, but we have different types of granules. So in general, engineering and the maintenance of the of a new functional consortium worked. We were quite happy about that. However, if you want to follow, for example, community analysis, it's required to sample individual photogranules, not just a graph sample and an average of several. And thirdly, there may be community and metabolite exchange between islands. And this is particularly fascinating to see actually how are things exchanged between the individual granules. This is something that we would like to investigate further. If you use uh, methanotropic photogranules, as we did here, for a biorefinery application, you might have to look out uh, for heterogeneity also, because you might want to target specific compounds only produced by the methanotropes, for example. And then this heterogeneity would certainly be a problem. Well, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, I'm happy to take your questions later in the session. Thank you very much. Bye.